Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Wednesday morning session, and it's my pleasure to be uh, session chair this morning. Our first speaker today is Artem Novokshinov. So Artem graduated from Tomsk Polytechnic University in 2013 and completed his PhD in 2017 at the same university. Since then, Artem has worked at DAISY in the Beam Diagnostics Group as a researcher with a focus on beam profile measurements. His areas of interest are beam diagnostics uh, and radiation technologies, including polarization radiation in particular. Uh, Artem will talk to us today about the first observation of quasi-monochromatic optical Cherenkov radiation in a dispersive medium, quartz. Over to you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to give a talk over here. So, kind of, let's get started. Uh, as you can see, my talk is about observation of quasi-monochromatic uh, Cherenkov radiation in dispersive media, which was a quartz crystal, and Let's go to the next one. So I will now briefly go through the agenda. The first one is the introduction, where I will tell slightly about the background of the Cherenkov radiation, which is quite well known, about our motivation to do these measurements. Then I will switch to theoretical model, which have been developed by a couple of co-authors of this paper for the Cherenkov radiation and other types of polarization current radiations. And then I'll switch to the experimental setup, which we had in mines at uh, MAMI Microtron. And then finally, as a sequence, I'll go to the results and summary. So the Chernikov radiation is a quite well-known type of radiation, which has been discovered in 1934 by Pavel Chernikov and then described by, theoretically by Tam and Frank. The type of radiation is widely used in different fields like elementary particle, elementary, oh, it doesn't work. Does it work? All right. As the elementary particle physics as, as an intense source of electromagnetic radiation and in beam diagnostics, but mostly in beam diagnostics it used is uh, in loss monitors and length measurements and so on. Nevertheless, it's already kind of in investigated in the community. So here you can see the paper or the colleagues uh, who have already started further investigations in that direction. Uh, the radiation itself, as I said, well known, and it uh, occurs when a particle goes with a velocity higher than the phase velocity of the light in the media. In this case, so the radiation goes under the angle it just doesn't work that well. At the, the uh, angle the chain cough, and so you can see uh, the picture. Come on. It doesn't work that well. So anyway, uh, the radiation is, goes in the cone around the particle behind it under the angle that I already said. And from this formula, one can consider uh, one can see that the, uh, there is a threshold, basically, which means that the uh, product of beta and n, which are a refractive index, have to be uh, larger than 1. Uh, here is our motivation to do these measurements, is the Cherenkov radiation, as I said, is widely used everywhere, but actually is not that widely used in profile diagnostics. Uh, in that case, it could be a substitute. It could to scintillators, such standard techniques like scintillators or transition radiation. And if we're talking about the beam profile measurements, so obviously it would be a, a thin Cherenkov radiation radiator, which would be a crystal plate, and so on. And once again, if you want to implement it to beam profile measurements, one has to investigate further the uh, uh, properties of the uh, radiation, such properties of like point spread function and spectrum of it. So that basically was our, our, our purpose of the investigations. As I will 
later be talking about the radiation from a thin crystal. I also decided to put this slide over here and slightly talk about the geometrical aspect of the radiation. So as one can see on the picture, when the particle goes through the uh, crystal uh, with, what is that? with dielectric uh, constant epsilon and thickness L, the radiation goes inside the crystal uh, under the angle theta chain curve and then after the uh, refraction uh, on the boundary it goes at the angle C plus uh, theta relative to the uh, Z prime axis. And from here it goes we can basically calculate finally the dependence of theta uh, vacuum angle on the uh, refractive index and uh, beta of the particle and the angle of the crystal tilt. So that how it goes basically we exchange the theta angle by uh, the arc sinus which is derived from the previous formula on the previous slide and then we come to this uh, formula finally. And what is important once again here that the out outgoing angle depends on the wavelength and the particle energy and the crystal tilt. And with the rotation of the crystal one can finally obtain the uh, separate spectral line from the uh, whole uh, Cherenkov spectrum. Uh, now we're moving to the theoretical model that have been derived by uh, our colleagues. <coughs> so the background for that was that the model already kind of existed. It existed and it was uh, made by Parformov. You can find it in this publication which is from 1971. But the problem with that was that it was even back in the days where the publication was only in Russian which doesn't help a lot to all the people. And then recently I found out that there is one in English but it still doesn't improve the situation in terms of simplicity of the approach. So the approach is quite cumbersome. That's why there was another model derived which is based on the uh, uh, polarization uh, currents approach and here is the publication where you can find the description of it and so on and the approach has polarization currents as the origin of the uh, radiation. So in principle the, pr the particle going through the media drive the, drives the polarization current whilst, go uh, whilst going through it and then the currents generate the magnetic field and the field quits the media. So this is the main background behind the theory. <coughs> Here you can see finally what we have, what the formula that we have to calculate the radiation from a thin crystal uh, with uh, infinite transversal size and infinite longitudinal one. So here on the picture one can see the crystal and the bunch going through it and the radiation getting out of the crystal and well looking at the formula one can still say that it's cumbersome but relative to the one that has been derived by Parform it's still way way easier, simpler. What is of importance to see from the formula is that it depends on S squared over lambda and power 3 and also on the cardinal sinc function uh, square which is sinc function uh, explains the uh, uh, gives us the uh, finite width of the spectral line of the Cherenkov radiation and in terms of L over, uh, over lambda it, it gives us intensity dependence. Then if we are talking about the uh, real media we have to take into account the uh, refractive index of the uh, uh, or the dielectric constant dispersion that's w w which is normally which normally depends on lambda as well. That's why we had to take in our calculation some uh, approach or model to consider this uh, in terms of quartz crystal that we used.
For that, we have chosen this Zellmeyer formula, which has been proven for silicon glasses at the wavelengths not higher than 700 nanometers, and uh, which was totally fine for us because we didn't go any further. And here we go to the point which what we require if you want to calculate chain radiation from, from a thin crystal. So the first one is once again we need this uh, connection between tether vacuum and psi angle. Then we need the uh, uh, in our case the mere formula to calculate the dispersion of the uh, uh, refractive index inside the crystal in the crystal. And then the last one is the uh, theoretical model that has been derived by colleagues. And um, if we combine all of it, we can finally uh, calculate chilling radiation from a thin crystal, which is introduced here, right? Here is the one of the examples how it looks like. Uh, so the picture on the left is the uh, Dependency, dependence of the uh, chain of radiation from the crystal on the tata vacuum and on the wavelength. It is calculated for 855 MeV electron because we will finally use exactly this energy in the measurements. Then the crystal thickness was 200 micrometers and the crystal tilt is 23 degree. And on the right hand side you can see the red one is the cut in the central at the fixed uh, tether vacuum angle. And the green one is the same but with a fixed uh, lambda. So finally what we will be looking for is the uh, uh, red one. So dependence of the, uh, uh, of the spectra on the uh, uh, tilt of the crystal or in other words on the tether vacuum. Also one has to mention now about the uh, uh, thickness or the width of the spectral line. So it depends on the thickness of the crystal as well as I said. Uh, and it was already derived in the original theory of time. So it proportional to lambda uh, over L and sinus of Cherenkov angle. So it means that Basically, the uh, thinner the crease, so the uh, th thinner the, uh, the thicker the line. Sorry. And here you can see the examples with 50 micrometer, 100 micrometers, and 200 micrometers thickness of the crystal. Now we're coming to the experimental setup that we had at uh, Microtron of Mami, or Microtron of Mines, sorry, which is called Mami. Uh, basically the experimental setup was over here. Exactly at that place the electron energies are 850 MeV on so that's all I can say about it at this slide. And here is the scheme of our experimental setup and the microtron. So as I said, electron energy was 850 MeV. The current that we've chosen was 45 nanoamps. The uh, size is 536 uh, by 6.3 nanometers, which uh, has been measured by a scintillator placed at the same holder. And oh, the emittances are also shown over here. So the experiment is, as you can see, the electron beam goes through the uh, uh, crystal once again. It radi the, the radiation is produced, and then what we can do, we can tilt the crystal. So here it is shown with the angle psi. With the tilt of the crystal, we will get onto the spectrometer the different lines, the different spectral lines of the Cherenkov radiation. So. The main idea, as I said already before, to tilt the crystal and re record the lines, different spectral lines. Um, the target 
which was 200 micrometer uh, fused silica uh, and 20 millimeter diameter was placed on the goniometric stage which exactly allowed us to turn it around and the spectrometer and objective you can see those ones we use they are normal ones that you can buy and a stock and now we are switching to the results so basically at the picture you can see five spectra for a different uh, tilt of the uh, crystal so the tilt of the crystal is exactly 22, 25, uh, 22.5, 23 and so on uh, all of the, uh, uh, the uh, spectra they correspond to the number of electrons passing through 6.25 times 10 to, uh, 10 to 14 and all of them has been uh, fitted by a skewed caution as it to fit at best so and now we're coming to the comparison of the uh, uh, of these results with the with the theory that we had. So we calculated the uh, 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 radiation for the exact same conditions and compared them. In this case, this is just comparison of the position of the peak. So once again, you see uh, the uh, 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 blue lines are the experimental uh, spectra that we had. And the black ones are the ones we calculated uh, with the uh, with the equations before. So one can see that, of course, the best match is at 22.5. All the other ones are slightly away uh, from each other. So this disagreement can be explained by uh, two factors. One of them is actually this Zellmer uh, model, which could not perfectly uh, describe the exact crystal that we used. And the other one that, for instance, we didn't take into account any thermal conditions. So when you constantly have the uh, crystal under the radiation, so the conditions cannot be the same. Then the comparison of the uh, intensity of the light. Uh, of this spectrum line. So one can see once again that the best uh, coincidence and match is at 22.5 degree angle and all the other ones are also kind of in the range of agreement I'd say the only disagreement, strong disagreement is at 24 degrees which we explain so the reason for that could be the chromatic aberrations of the uh, uh, focusing lens or the objective so basically it means because of those not all of the light at this exact wavelength got into the uh, uh, spectrometer slip and that's why we just registered less as we understand it. So now I'm coming ready to summary. First I have to point out that quasi monochromatic radiation from uh, Chernikov radiation, oh, sorry, from dispersive uh, media has been observed. And the measurements are well described by the uh, model derived by the model uh, of polarization currents that kind of already improves the understanding of it. Uh, then there are some discrepancies but those ones I guess uh, just uh, should be studied or investigated in future more. And as I was talking already before such targets, uh, crystals for Cherenkov radiation could be useful uh, or could be of interest among the beam profile diagnostic community in terms of substitute for scintillators or OTR and uh, this is that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, I have a, is there a question over there? Yeah. Yes, I, I have a question. <clears throat> 
for the utilization of this as a diagnostic technique, I understand that the target would be uh, would be glass essentially, would be quartz. And can you mm -hmm. comment on the, the the radiation resistance of that as a substitute to uh, scintillation screen or metallic screen for OTR? Cannot command exactly in numbers, but quartz is way better than scintillators, at least in terms of radiation hardness. I can commit more. I mean, <clears throat> the you know the the fact that when when you have impurities in in these materials, the optical transmissivity go down. So you would expect to have, let's say, a, a, a progressive decrease of the signal because the, it's true that the, the yeah. screen will be very thin, but you would probably need to cope with the fact that the, let's say the, the light signal would go down, the optical yield would go down as the dose absorbed by the, the target is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, goes up. I, uh, it was just a, a comment about that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, will you be trying different crystal thicknesses to verify your uh, full width half maximum? This is one of the first steps actually because we kind of already ordered different crystals and this is the first step to check out what would be the result or signal or so on from different thicknesses because that would uh, another way of understanding our point spread function for instance and so on. And also thinking ahead um, both transition radiation and diffraction radiation become coherent if the electron bunch length becomes short and comparable to the wavelength. Have you tried to factor that into your uh, analysis yet? This is not added to the analysis, but only kind of log logically thinking about this, that shouldn't be the case. So this is one of the advantages because OTR would get to the uh, uh, coherent effects in a uh, the short bunches, which shouldn't be in principle the case for the uh, uh, Cherenkov crystals. And, like, that's why we consider it as a substitute, but it wasn't investigated well. All right, good. Yeah, it wasn't that. Uh, I wanted to, um, to ask if uh, how you, you, you talk about using it as a diagnostic, as a substitute for OTR or, or something mm -hmm. of that sort. I'm just trying to understand the configuration and the way in which you make use of it to profile a beam. Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean? I probably didn't understand exactly the question. What do you mean the configuration? Well, I, I'm trying to uh, imagine the design of an instrument that would use this as compared to using, for example, OTR to get a beam profile. Okay, so in principle, actually, at this experiment, we already had measurements of the beam even with the crystal, which was not, which didn't give us the same results as the uh, scintillator, for instance, but it also not well understood for the moment, but the configuration is kind of the same. You put the crystal, you choose the geometry, and then you have your imaging system, if I understood your question correctly with this objective, oh sorry, objective and, and the camera. Well, I'm, I'm trying to, I mean, you get the, the very various monochromatic, quasi-monochromatic uh, wavelengths out at different angles, but I, how to put that together to look ah, at the, that's, the that's what I mean. okay. uh, of the beam, that's what puzzles me. I got a question. So, in terms of the uh, beam size, beam profile measurements, this, this has nothing to do with that directly. But this was one of the measurements to prove the model, to understand, because if you want to measure your uh, beam profile, you have to understand the point spread function, you have to understand the uh, spectra and so on. So this is just one of the first steps to understand the model and how well it describes the radiation from it. As I said, we're just thinking about different thicknesses of the crystals to understand more about point spread function in that sense. And so it's just like step by step process to understand it well. Thank you. Um, I've got another question in, in regard to a potential um, application, you said replacement for OTR. So can you estimate what the light output, the total integrated light output of this method compared to OTR is? Wait a moment, can you repeat the second half of the question? I did. What's the integrated light output in comparison to OTR? 
uh, in numbers I cannot, can, uh, cannot tell right now by heart, but the light output from the uh, Chenkov crystals, from quartz crystals, way higher than OTR. Okay. And it's lower than scintillator, but higher from, than, than OTR. So somewhere between OTR yeah, and scintillator. But of course it depends exactly on energy the, and so on and yeah, so on. So more or less exactly in the middle. We must go through the mass to figure out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe just a quick question on um, as far as I'm aware of there's some kind of limit with these things about what kind of bunch lengths uh, you can resolve still and um, as far as I'm aware of with these uh, crystals the, the, the thicker they get the um, broader you also your uh, image gets and then you cannot resolve your bunch probably anymore. So wait, wait, can, can you repeat because I hardly can hear you to be honest. You, you can't hear it? Oh yeah. okay sorry. <laughs> yeah that's better. Um, just um, the question was uh, have you plans in further investigating um, the, what the lower limit basically is, what you can still resolve as a bunch length with these um, crystals. Is bunch? Yeah, I think so. I cannot tell you that it's planned right now to resolve any uh, bunch length, but it could possibly be done. I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't planned. Okay. Yeah. To do anything with the bunch length measurements. All right. For us. Okay. Okay, I have one question actually. Right. So I think you mentioned um, the future work to try and improve the discrepancy between the model and the experimental data would be to take into account the thermal conditions of the crystal. Uh, how would you do that? To improve the first is the, um, once again as I said, we want to take different thicknesses, want to investigate more of the crystals because this crystal actually we've taken it but like it wasn't that well known, the manufacturing process of the crystal and so on. So to take more samples to investigate them more in terms of the spectra, to investigate more in terms of the uh, images that we can get of the beam from them and so on. So this is this what we want to do. Because this all you can describe also by the, uh, uh, by the model derived and that would be the way it go. Okay, if there are no further questions, let us thank our speaker again. Thanks. And our next speaker this morning is Nazanin Zamadi. Nazanin received her master's de degree in biomedical engineering and her PhD in physics and engineering physics at the University of Saskatchewan, Canada where she worked on synchrotron source diagnostics along with x-ray optics instrumentation and application. She is currently a postdoc at the x-ray optics and application group at the Paul Scherer Institute. Her work mainly focuses on developing advanced x-ray optics and she also continues the development of new tools for source diagnostics. Nazanin will talk to us today uh, on an X-ray beam property analyzer based on dispersive crystal diffraction. Over to you. Um, thank you so much, Lorraine, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work here. Um, I would be presenting this work on behalf of our group, uh, which could not be done with the help of everybody, since I'm also from the X-ray optics side, so I used a lot of help from the, uh, all the departments uh, at the institute, from the machine side to, to the beam lines. Um, so the motivation for our work was with the new generation light sources. As you all know, we have challenges for um, source diagnostics to be able to measure the source position, angle, size, and emittance. Also on the beamline size, for us, it's very important now, ever more important, to be able to um, have a better understanding of the source that is delivered at the end of the station. So we need better uh, diagnostics at the beamline for um, source and optics stability measurements, and also for feedback uh, control of the optics uh, setup that we have at the beamline and if possible for post-correction of the experimental data. 
Um, there are many different methods for measuring the source size. Uh, you know well about all of them. They have all dif uh, different pros and cons, and they can be applied in different um, facilities depending on the requirements for the um, source size uh, measurements and the speed and sensitivity. Um, previously, we've presented a different uh, method, which was based on uh, diffraction from X-ray crystals and using an absorption cage of an element. And then um, I will be presenting a, a new method, uh, which is, in a, in a sense, improve uh, some of the limitations in the sensitivity sense for the previous system. Uh, we call it an X-ray beam property analyzer based on dispersive crystal diffraction. So dispersion. Um, when you look at the monochromator at the beam line, it can be a single crystal, a double crystal, uh, in a Laue or Bragg geometry. Here you can see in the figure uh, a double crystal um, setup that it's called a non dispersive setting. So you have the first crystal that just monochromatizes the beam. And the second crystal, all it does, it's in a non dispersive geometry, so it doesn't change the energy that was already selected by the first crystal. All it does is just throws the beam parallel to the incident beam. And on the plot, you can see the energy and divergence angle relationship that is then created by this crystal. So now if I look at so the first one was in the Bragg geometry. Now I, if I look at the Laue geometry, so you're going through the crystal. And the energy and divergence angle relationship of that Laue would look like this if you would consider to put this Laue in a dispersive geometry now compared to the first crystal you had on your DCM. So now here I'm showing a DCM because that was what we used at the beam line, but you don't need the second crystal. So all ha that happens there is you have the first crystal that monochromatizes the beam or crystal setup, and then you have the second crystal, the Laue, which is in a dispersive geometry compared to your first crystal. So what Laue is also doing is also selects a specific energy there. So if I now put these two set up together, the Bragg chose an energy bandwidth the Laue will choose a different energy bandwidth, which is a lot narrower, and it would just chisel out the middle part of the beam that was created by the, the first crystal. So now you have a very narrow normalized tr transmission through this uh, crystal setup. And the information that you get on this last plot um, will contain information about the source position, which is the location of that dip, and also about the source uh, size, which is the, how broad and the width of the dip is. So now we put that to the experiment. Um, if you look at the, the simulation that we did before the actual experiment, you can see if your source is fixed at a zero position, so R0 was the center, center of the detector. Um, you have the beam going on the flat, when I say flat beam, it's just beam going through the crystal, um, the Bragg uh, crystal. Sure. Uh, beam going through the first flat crystal, which is just monochromatizing the beam, so you have a near Gaussian shape. And now if I put the Lau in a dispersive geometry, then you would see the, the transmission profile here uh, with that center wavelength missing from your profile now here. And the normalized valley dip would look like this. So now, if I move the beam up again here, source position, the Gaussian location is moving, the profile from the transmission profile and the dip of the valley is also moving up. But if I tilt the beam in an angle, because this is only sensitive to the energy and the energy was already selected by the monochromator, the location of the dip will not move. So the profile of the Gaussian, the beam is moving in the tilt in the source, but not the location of the dip. And then doing the same thing with changing the um, source size and source divergence, you would have the same uh, reaction. So your uh, width will broaden 
by changing the source size, but not by the changing the source divergence. Um, to experiment the setup, we went, we tested the, the idea in two beamlines. So we have an optics beamline, which is mostly used for instrumentation. Um, that was done for the proof of principle. At that time, we could uh, get a machine development shift uh, dedicated, which we could change the electron source size by changing the coupling and then make measurements also at the beamline to see how well we can track the changes of the source size. And then we also did further experiment at the tomography beamline to um, explore the possibility of the real time measurements because they have a very good setup for uh, time resolution and very fast uh, imaging and very good detectors basically. And also be able to compare this setup with uh, measurements with zone plates for measuring the source size. So here in the, in the figure you can see the beam through the first crystal and, and also how it would look like when you have the middle part, the energy missing. So you have the transmitted beam. You could possibly also look at the, uh, the diffracted beam over here, which is uh, slightly in an angle. But uh, for this, all we looked for the most part was just looking at the transmitted beam. So this is just a, a brief uh, picture of the setup, how it looked like. Um, at the optics beam line, we had to put up the detector together with the scintillator, which was about 100 micron thick. And uh, at the at Tomcat, the scintillator was about 500 micron. Uh, we had a bit, we were a bit more relaxed with the source size at Tomcat. It's a super band. Um, the detector effective pixel size at the at Tomcat beam line was about uh, 11 micron, and at the optics beam line was a three point two five. For both uh, experiments, we used the silicon 111 monochromator at the optics beam line around 18 kV, and at Tomcat around 20 kV. The major difference between these two monochromators was the monochromator at the optics beamline is a channel cut. So the two crystals are uh, bound together. They're cut from the same um, crystal block. So polishing the middle of these crystals is quite difficult. So you do not get a very nice smooth surface, though they're quite stable. And the uh, monochromator on the optics beamline is cryocooled. So you have better uh, chances with not having problems with the heat load on the mono. At Tomcat, though, it's uh, two separate crystals. So the surface of the crystal is very nicely polished. Uh, but then it's water cooled. So there would be a little bit of effects from the thermal bump on the mono. So we did measurements uh, just to show you an experimental comparison of the two beams that we got from these two uh, monochromators. You can already see all of the, the defects we had from the uh, mono from the optics beam line uh, with all the lines and uh, makes the profile not so smooth. Uh, so you see the flat beam is uh, near Gaussian and it can be easily fitted and modeled. And then the transmitted beam with the location of the dip from both experiments. To extract the information, um, the images were summed over the horizontal to create the, the 1D plot. And then the, the transmitted beam was then normalized by the flat beam. And then the, this normalized um, location of the dip, basically profile of the dip was created. And then there you can see the fit to the data. This can be easily modeled because the information about the um, dynamical, from the dynamical theory about the diffraction from silicon crystals is well known so you can easily predict and model that. That's why also the fit um, matches the experiment quite well. Actually we had a better matching from the information from the optics beamline because there we didn't have any problem with the harmonics since it has a very uh, smaller critical energy. To extract the information, basically the width of the dip, so I would talk about mostly source size here. The width of the dip is, um, includes the uh, intensity at the profile you're having your, from your point source, and then also the convolution of the size of, the, of your source to that. And then you can see here in this um, error minimization, we have the IM is our measurements. Uh, this is the model of the point source simulated and the size of the source is the IS. So by minimizing the error uh, uh, using IM, the normalized transmission, we were able to extract the uh, 
uh, electron source uh, size and divergence. And then from the same, we could get the position and angle by looking at the location of the dip, uh, how it was moving on the detector throughout the experiment. Um, so now going to the Tomcat uh, experiment, um, the, there were measurements done before to measure the source size there with zone plates. This was done about like a month before we did our experiment. They measured about 17 micron. With our measurements, we could extract uh, around 17 micron with 400 millisecond data. The Tomcat measurements were done to push the limits of the exposure time. So we started from 400 millisecond down to 4 millisecond. All of that data is not processed, so it goes a bit, uh, takes a bit time to do all the fitting. And uh, so we are looking at the time resolution data still. Um, but we had a good match with the zone plate measurements. The, there has been a grating measurements done at the beamline um, before, but this one it was in 2014 and uh, with uh, slightly different machine settings. Um, so they measured at the time 15 micron source size. The plan was at the time we were doing these measurements to have, because the band magnet uh, spectrum is quite wide, so the idea was we would do these Lowy measurements at the same time the other part of the beam is used to, um, horizontal width of the beam is used to do grating measurements. We had the grating fabricated. Unfortunately, to hold it on the holder, it broke at the day of the experiment, so we have to redo the experiment. We could not do the grating measurements exactly again on the same day. And uh, in the pictures, you can see the setup for the zone plates and also gratings at Tomcat Beamline. Um, going back to the optics beamline, where we had the uh, um, possibility of changing the electron source size, uh, we changed the, uh, we could not go below 10 micron because that was our goal to see how uh, far we can push the measurements. Uh, at the time with the optics setup at the machine, we could only go uh, around 12 micron for the vertical source size. And uh, you can see the red dotted line here is the model fit to our experimentally extracted data that was predicted by our machine people uh, from the beam dynamics group that how would they pre predict it to see the result the way they were changing the source size at the beam line. Uh, we could have measurement sensitivity of about 10% uh, of the source size, which um, what I understood is what is mostly required. Um, and then here in the table, you can see all the um, four parameters that were measured from the electron source size that day uh, at the beamline. So you can see the, the source size, a sigma y, the source divergence, a beam position, source position, and source angle. So the beam position is the overall beam position, y uh, plus dy prime, the distance that we are from the source, and then the source position and angle. You can see the beam position throughout changing the experiment, uh, the changing the source size was relatively stable, though the, uh, here extracting only the source position looks like we had motion or movement in the source, but that was just the two crystals of the mono um, tilting slightly together, uh, moving on a, with a fixed vibration. This we've studied with simulation before. That's another um, possibility with these type of measurements that you can uh, separate the type of measurement uh, motions you're getting from your monochromator compared to the motions you're actually getting from the source. Um, we also did simulations with, uh, with ray tracing using uh, OASIS uh, platform to uh, investigate the possibility of using this method to measure the source uh, on an undulator beamline for an, a proposed undulator for the SLS2 upgrade. And the uh, simulations show that by just changing the um, type of the crystal, so we use for the most part a silicon 111 just to increase the sensitivity, we had to use a 333 uh, crystal for these simulations. Uh, we were able to use a transmitted beam for measuring the source position uh, and also changes in the source size to measure an undulator source um, size and position. Just to zoom in on the transmitted beam there, you can see um, in the um, solid black line, you have the nominal source. 
And then with the red dotted line here is if we move the source around, and then the, the blue is if you tilt it in an angle. And here you can see how the width of the valley would change if we change the source uh, size, sigma y, or divergence. Just to summary, uh, we uh, propose a system, if useful, for people to, to consider that could work both on band magnets and undulator beamlines. It could be used for electron source diagnostics and also for beamline uh, for photon diagnostics, uh, either at a dedicated band magnet or uh, on an operating beamline to steal a part of the beam for uh, real time monitoring of the source and possibly correcting uh, experimental data. Uh, we are exploring the applications of the setup because it can be also used with the very thin crystals if it can be possible to use the system for uh, XFEL diagnostics. And with that, I would like to thank all of my colleagues from the machine side of PSI, from the photon science, and also uh, from APS and the uh, Canadian light, uh, light source. Um, and also would like to thank you for your attention and would be happy with answer questions. Thank you very much for this clear talk. Any questions from the audience, please? There's one at the back. Thank you. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I like the concept. So uh, I have two questions, in fact. So your approach is based in the fact that the lower geometry prov provides much better energy resolution. Is that right? Yes, because it's put in a dispersive setting to the uh, <coughs> DCM, so it takes a narrower bandwidth, yes. Okay. And then the second question is, wouldn't it be more obvious just to measure directly diffracted beam by Laue crystal? Um, just only the Laue crystal. Yeah, just diffracted beam by, by Laue because, I mean, otherwise you have the, this deep in the Gaussian shape, but you could just measure directly the diffracted beam by Laue crystal. You can measure directly just the diffracted beam from either Laue or the Bragg, but by not having the dip, what you're measuring is the overall source size, so you cannot disentangle the source divergence and the size. You can uh, still subtract the f photon uh, contribution, but you cannot separate the source size and divergence. So the reason we use the dip is just because the dip only contains information about the source size, not the diversion, so you can subtract the two. Okay, cool, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we do the question at the back and then the question in the middle, please. Um, did you try to analyze what will define the resolution of your system? So, as I can guess, numerical aperture will be defined by the divergence of the beam. Yeah? Yes, so the bandwidth of the crystal compared to the divergence of the beam is what would define our, uh, one of the things that would define the resolution. So we need to choose a crystal with its bandwidth that is smaller compared to the divergence of the beam. And the other limitation would be flux. So far we didn't run into that problem. Uh, so it's all about the signal to noise. So we need to reduce the dark current of the detector compared to, to the flux. So with some of the measurements we also summed in the horizontal or add a couple of images together to just improve the error bar. And one more question. So basically your kind use approach of visibility function. Um, yes. And did you try to analyze what else will affect this peak to valley? Like right now you're saying it's only the source size will affect it. But are there any other parameters which could affect? The thickness of the crystal would also affect because if the crystal is too thick then you would run into anomalous transmission so you do not have this uh, nice uh, deep there. So that needs to be optimized uh, to begin with. So in the very beginning you have to optimize the thickness of the crystal so you have the uh, most symmetric shape of the dip and the uh, narrowest bandwidth. Okay. So my question is uh, similar to the previous question. Uh, the, what is the minimum beam size 
the, the, your setup can measure. Um, uh, it just depends on the, I think, uh, uh, depends on the wavelengths. But, uh, it, uh, again, it goes back to this the, a relationship between the divergence of the source and the bandwidth of the crystal. We didn't observe any limit with existing mm -hmm. sources, like mm -hmm. by simulation. Mm -hmm. We simulated down to about three micron source three size. Micron. We still were able to extract the source size mm -hmm. from the oh, tip. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have one question. Sure. Um, what are the challenges you foresee in adapting this technique for use on XFELs? Um, yeah. I don't know all the details about that experiment, but uh, we, I, I think one of the things would be the very thin crystal geometry that we consider for XFEL. It would make it quite hard to hold the crystal and not bend it because the crystal needs to be held relatively tight so it doesn't move around to create vibrations and blur the source size, but also for XFEL application, to have it transparent if it needs to be, then the crystal needs to be quite thin if you are going to use the beam for further experiments. But if it's just for diagnostic purposes, then can be different application, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, in that case, let us think, thank our speaker thank again. You. Thanks, Nazanin. And our next speaker today uh, is Pascal Clagg. Pascal studied physics at Mainz University, and his interest lies in precision measurements. Presently, Pascal works as a physicist on the MAMI accelerator with interest in the challenge of the alignment of the machine and the properties of relativistic light sources in order to achieve the required accuracy. Pascal Clagg will be talking to us today on high accuracy measurement of the absolute beam energy by synchrotron radiation interferometry with relativistic electrons. Thank you, Pascal. And just a reminder to please stay close to the microphone. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> thank you for, for this uh, nice introduction and uh, also for this, this uh, invitation that uh, already some you know, very interesting conversations. So, but uh, today I will uh, talk about the uh, energy measurement. And first, I would like to give a, a motivation why is this energy measurement uh, interesting? Because it's a, a calibration measurement of our accelerator. So um, we would like to measure this uh, so-called uh, three lambda hydrogen, which is uh, yeah, a hydrogen with a lambda particle, so uh, um, a deuteron uh, together with a very slightly bound uh, lambda particle. So the lambda particle contains uh, strangeness, which we see in a, a further slide. So um, the, the, uh, there is uh, some kind of a puzzle so there's this uh, the, um, new, uh, the, uh, isolated uh, lambda particle, so which if it's not, not bound, also decays uh, with a weak decay. And um, if it is bound to this uh, deuteron, it is a slightly smaller um, uh, um, lifetime. And uh, okay, in Mainz we cannot measure the lifetime. So here, for example, at uh, ELF, at our friends in Japan, they can measure the uh, lifetime. But what we can measure in Mainz very precisely is the binding energy. And uh, yeah, so this is the setup, how it is done. So uh, this is our spectrometer uh, facility. So uh, the electrons are coming here from below and then then this, uh, in the center here is this uh, an hypernucleus produced. So uh, this is still the, the old slide. So today, um, right now, the, the um, accelerator is, uh, has been set up for a lithium target because you have a um, reduced amount of uh, fragmentation um, that, that is produced. Uh, but uh, that, uh, the experiment that has been done in 2014 has been done with uh, beryllium. So you're shooting the electrons at beryllium and producing a K plus. So the, the K on is going to the chaos spectrometer. Then you know it, uh, strange has been produced. 
and then uh, the, the nucleus uh, fragments until to hopefully <laughs> three or four lambda hydrogen. And then what we then measure is the, the uh, weak decay, uh, the, the uh, pion which comes from the weak decay. So and this is then done in these uh, uh, green and red spectrometer. And as you can, so here you can see the, the spectrum of this pions. So here this is a four lambda hydrogen, but the process is in principle the same. And um, here you, you, you see that the spectrometer has a quite high resolution, but what is unknown is the absolute value of this um, momentum in the, inside of the spectrometer. So uh, what we can do is we can, uh, so like Artyom said that we can uh, have different energies. So for the production of the uh, lambda particle we need 1.6 GeV, but we can also work with um, 180 MeV. And then we uh, uh, shoot our, 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 for example, carbon target and uh, measure where is the uh, elastic line of, and uh, then, we only need to know the, um, uh, to, yeah, the momentum of, to, to set this momentum inside of our spectrometer and then we know the absolute position of this, uh, yeah, of the, then we have absolute calibration of the spectrometer and then we can determine the momentum of the pion. So, and uh, in order to measure the energy of the electrons precisely, we need an energy measurement of the electrons, of course. So, um, and uh, yeah, this brings me to the method how I am doing this uh, energy measurement. So uh, we need two coherent light sources, which are here uh, shown in red and in blue, and the electrons are entering from the left and then are bent away into it and dumped. And uh, in those uh, coherent light sources, then uh, two pulses are produced. Those pulses are entering a, a monochromator, and um, yeah, and afterwards, so they can be ob observed in a detector and a camera, of course. So those light sources are separated by this variable distance d. This will be shown in a further slide. And due to the separation of the two light sources, uh, these uh, pulses are also separated. And uh, if they are brought into a monochromator, then we uh, see at each pixel in our, inside of our camera this uh, oscillation uh, profile if the, the, the um, source, the second source is moved. So, and the, this oscillation period has um, a relation to the wavelength which, are, which we are observing in our detector. So, we have lambda oscillation is uh, proportional to uh, two gamma squared and uh, selected wavelength lambda L. So, uh, okay, I mentioned the 180 MeV, but we can also go 15 MeV higher. And in this example, if we select 400 nanometers and uh, we have an energy of uh, 195 MeV, then this oscillation period is quite macroscopically with uh, ten, uh, yeah, about uh, 10 centimeters. So the idea of this precision measurement is we can measure this uh, oscillation period very precisely because uh, you have a linear stage which you can measure the position up to micrometer and uh, the wavelengths can also be very precisely determined because, uh, for example, with a mercury lamp, you have a 404 nanometers uh, calibration line. So if these two uh, variables are precisely defined, we, only, we can then calculate uh, gamma. Okay, so this is uh, as, yeah, a, a rendered schematic of the, of the setup. So here these are the two sources. And uh, yeah, here in between the monochromator and the sources there is uh, an, an aperture. So this is not to scale. So the aperture and the monochromator are about 10 meters away. So this will be important on the next slides. <coughs> so uh, okay, most of you know how an undulator looks like, but I still uh, brought this, um, this slide because uh, I want to mention that uh, the undulator is completely um, uh, electromagnetically driven and this is, uh, this, we have chosen this because we can in situ uh, calibrate uh, the, the undulators. <coughs> 
because we, we, because for different energy you need to uh, change the magnetic field. So if you change the electron energies and you want to still to be in the 400 nanometers range, then you need to adjust the fields, and this is why we had to uh, in situ uh, calibrate the magnetic fields. So uh, okay, it has a length of uh, 500 nanometer, uh, 500 meter, millimeters, and uh, the period is uh, um, 80 millimeters, so it only has uh, six uh, periods. Okay, so uh, with this um, only uh, six periods, so it, it means that okay, the, the source has uh, quite short. That means that the spectrum we will see is quite large. So um, yeah, and, um, okay. First, I would like to before I show you the spectrum, I would like to show you the, the pair of how we set it up. So this one is the first undulator uh, emitting this uh, pulse in, in colored in red, and uh, the second undulator. This can be moved. So this uh, the the new stage can move it up to 900 millimeters, and that means that we can almost see um, nine periods, and it uh, greatly improves the systematic studies of uh, the um, yeah of the energy measurement. <coughs> and the second one emits uh, the blue uh, pulse and it is of course uh, delayed because the electrons are slower than light. And yeah, this is how an ideal uh, spectrum would look like. So um, I think many of you know this uh, banana shaped uh, spectrum so in the x axis of course the wavelength here we at 404 nanometers we have the calibration line for uh, the mercury lamp and what is also important is uh, that um, we have here this uh, absolute angle zero yeah and uh, in that case uh, yeah you could analyze very precisely the energy by just ta uh, selecting one of these pixels and uh, follow how the um, how this oscillation evolves and exactly this I will show you in this uh, video. So as I said, the spectrum is quite uh, wide, so this is uh, more, uh, more than 100 nanometers. But um, this is taken with a Prisma spectrometer. And uh, what I want, uh, so I want to uh, take your attention towards this uh, red dot. So this red dot is a selected pixel or selected wavelength. And um, yeah, the m movement of this uh, red dot is exactly this um, sinusoidal, follows this sinusoidal motion. Okay, so if we follow this red spot, then uh, and to take this against the undulator position, then yeah, we see exactly this uh, oscillation. And then, as you can see, you make a, a sine fit. And uh, yeah, then you can calculate from the uh, you determine with the sine fit the oscillation period, and um, the selected wavelength is known. Then everything is easy, and you can determine the um, the energy. So, and of course, a camera has many pixels. So, uh, of course, you can for one systematic study is taking uh, different pixels. So every pixel has a different wavelength. So uh, the corresponding oscillation period should also so uh, very in the same manner, and you assume, of course, uh, constant because the energy is uh, constant in, in this um, in this process. Yeah, and uh, here again, the, the calibration line lies uh, within the spectrum. So, okay, now the second part of my uh, presentation will be about uh, the position. So it's uh, closely rel related to our last <laughs> talk, but we did it uh, differently. So um, uh, classically, the um, setup is done with uh, theater lights. You have uh, a telescope uh, which is uh, put, um, yeah, in the uh, in alignment to uh, to the beam line, and uh, then you are setting up, for example, XY monitors and uh, quadrupoles and of course the undulators and also the aperture. So, um, this is uh, important because in order to uh, determine the, the energy precisely you need to determine this, um, this observation angle very precisely because if, the, um, if you are looking off axis then um, this delta gamma 
um, uh, above here is non zero. So if you take this uh, equation, so um, this is what happens if uh, you are, if the beam and the aperture do have an offset, then you have a, a non zero delta theta. So, okay, the denominator you can more or less uh, uh, ignore against to the one. So that means that you have a uh, um, gamma squared times delta theta squared. Which uh, is a, a squared, and so the the, um, the uncertainty of the energy depends uh, second order to this angle and gamma as well. So uh, this is uh, not very nice. Um, so that means that you have to determine this angle very precisely. And uh, if we take this uh, telescope for alignment, so the uh, so for, for each component, let's assume that you have uh, a tenth of a millimeter uh, accuracy. Um, but like I said, you have to set up several components, so uh, the XY monitors, the quadrupoles, and the aperture. And then uh, s uh, still you also have to align the beam absolutely also uh, to all of this and we um, and uh, if we assume that we have in uh, 10 meters uh, distance only an arrow made by this um, by this setup from uh, half a millimeter then the uh, the accuracy of the measurement is already larger than uh, 100 keV so this is very unfavorable and on top of this uh, it is you are still kind of uh, blind so uh, you set everything up and say okay I made it um, everything perfect but uh, yeah maybe something uh, maybe something happened so how can uh, how can oh microphone is yeah. Okay, I have to speak up. <laughs> Is the mic still on? Hang on. Um, can you hear me? Is it still? Yes. Yeah, oh, you okay, can. Okay, okay. okay, it's just for so, us. Okay. Um, just I can't hear me. <laughs> um, okay, so um, <clears throat> the, uh, in order to uh, determine the the uh, the absolute angle, if you have a, a spectrum like this, you would uh, you could, for example, take a, a slice here and make a, more or less a Gaussian fit and uh, see if the uh, so if you can, for example, take the source, uh, or you uh, use the um, you try to maximize the. Um, the, the, the gamma, the measured gamma, which is also, uh, as uh, you have seen in the equation before, the gamma is maximal in uh, the central angle. But uh, then uh, a problem occurred, and uh, this has again something to do with uh, aperture. So if you, you have very coherent light sources, and uh, those um, uh, those light sources, when they are uh, uh, hitting the aperture, of course, you have uh, very nice uh, diffraction patterns, which you can see in uh, this slide. So uh, again, in the horizontal axis, uh, you have the wavelength, and in the vertical axis, uh, you have a diffraction pattern. And uh, in fact, um, it, uh, since the spectrometer is uh, 3.5 meters away from the aperture, it was not my first uh, guess that this is Fresnel diffraction, but it is uh, really a, a, a book-like example for Fresnel diffraction because uh, the aperture is uh, 8 millimeters high, and in this distance you uh, get a very nice uh, diffraction pattern. So on the one hand, this was uh, quite complicated uh, to, in, to, to find a model that includes, on the one hand, this oscillatory behavior of um, the intensity, and on the second hand, the, in, to include the Fresnel diffraction. And um, yeah, this took quite some time, but uh, yeah, it worked. And uh, like I, will, I, and I will show you that this is also quite beneficial for the alignment. So, uh, so this is one example. So you take one one pixel, slide, so one column of pixel from this uh, from the spectrum, uh, which is uh, shown uh, as the blue curve, and uh, the the, um, the orange curve. You can see that this uh, nicely fits to uh, to this um, to the data, <coughs> and uh, yeah, and then of course uh, you can calculate from this. Uh, the, um, the intensity without uh, the diffraction included. <coughs> but uh, 
Um, you have many different cases. So at the moment, we are approaching high intensity. So this is uh, the book-like example, which I mentioned. But uh, then um, the, uh, it evolves further and reaches an almost Gaussian or truncated Gaussian. And then it reaches a minimum. And then it, uh, it goes up again. And uh, finding a model to describe all of these uh, cases was not, uh, yeah, it, it uh, took some, some time. So in total, this is a, a, you need uh, seven parameters, which also include the, the offset position. Yeah, so uh, because uh, the, this, this uh, truncated Gaussian becomes asymmetric, or the, all become slightly asymmetric, but the book-like example is uh, not so affected by asymmetry. But uh, the truncated Gaussian is quite strongly affected if you move the light source against uh, the aperture. And uh, yeah, this is um, one. Uh, this is uh, two examples. So we uh, are using um, at, at Mami for this measurement um, a beam position uh, regulation or <coughs> uh, from uh, Jürgen Diefenbach and uh, Ruth Kempf. Which, is, uh, which works very nicely. And this is one example with uh, regulation activated. And uh, if you take uh, several of these, um, of, uh, so the, in the video, if you, for example, take 100 data points of this and uh, tr uh, find the position of this uh, area and then take, the, take an, another 100 steps and uh, uh, determine the position of this, then you will find that uh, the standard deviations of, uh, of these uh, determined positions is uh, 65 micrometers, which is not, uh, in this case, uh, divided by the square root of, uh, of measurements because I wanted to compare it to the case without regulation. So this is a quite symmetric distribution of position uh, reconstructions. And uh, this is, uh, uh, without regulation, you can see a drift of the electron beam and here you can see that the uh, uh, standard deviation here is uh, three times larger. So okay, it's, um, it is uh, 150 micrometers, so you would say it's not so severe. But like I said, you have a second order dependency on the angle, so don't make fun with the, uh, with the angle. So uh, in very short times, you can get uh, back to a problematic region. And, uh, but uh, with the regulation and with this determination of the, of the, um, of the truncated, uh, or in, in principle, it's not, uh, not only the truncated I included, you make an, an fit over everything and uh, then uh, calculate uh, the, um, the position out of this. <coughs> and um, since I have a spectrometer, I can only determine one, uh, one dimension because in the other direction, uh, all the angles are integrated over and uh, my solution was, first, I, in an in a earlier beam time, I used uh, a so-called duff prisma. If you turn, uh, tilt it by 45 degrees in, on axis, you, have, uh, you can rotate your image by 90 degrees. But uh, duff prisma has uh, this, this type of, um, of uh, uh, um, yeah, edges. And uh, this is very unfavorable because this in induces uh, also a small amount of um, dispersion. And uh, the idea was then to build a, a prisma, which is in principle a triple, triple mirror together with a pair of uh, periscopes to get back to the, to the axis. And this allows um, to rotate uh, the image, like you can see here in the middle, without, uh, or with an ex uh, extremely suppressed uh, um, dispersion. <coughs> And uh, with, uh, yeah, with that, you can then determine the angle of the, of the perpendicular direction. So, and with this uh, information of the, of the position determination, uh, you can reach much smaller uncertainties for this angle. And the great benefit is that uh, you measured the um, uh, source versus, uh, versus the aperture uh, when, when everything is installed. So you do not rely on, on, um, on uh, um, different position monitors. <coughs> So, uh, and with that, uh, one, one can reach a uh, single KEV uh, accuracy. Okay, so um, I'm, at the moment I would like to summarize the different error contributions. So statistical means that you can, of course, in every pixel take the, um, take, uh, the energy. 
And uh, since it is a constant, uh, you can uh, divide over many pixels that are contributing to this and you easily reach a uh, statistical uncertainty below 1 keV. And, um, of, but uh, of course there are systematics. And, uh, and this is very, uh, very nice because uh, previously in my diploma thesis, this was absolutely the dominating uh, the dominating error, and uh, due to the understanding of the um, diffraction image, we could reduce uh, this by uh, yeah, s some orders of magnitude. And uh, then, of course, you have an, a systematic error due to the calibration of uh, with the mercury lamp. <coughs> uh, and finally, the largest error contribution still comes from the model. So. Um, uh, uh, how is this determined? So, of course, the, r the result of the, of the fitting program is uh, also single KV, but uh, this is uh, nonsense. So, in order to determine the uh, fitting error, um, we split the, um, the oscillations in the whole oscillation into two parts and then um, calculated a period for the first part and calculated the period of the second part and uh, then compared it to the, to the total. And this is how the, uh, the systematic error of the fit is uh, produced. Yeah, okay, then uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? In the middle, please. Thank you for your nice presentation. Well, I suppose you, if you want to get very accurate energy measurement, I suppose you need mm, accuracy for both monochromator and undulator distances. Is that right? Uh, I, I need um, uh, yeah. So the, the alignment has to be has to be. Uh, so the undulators, the alignment of the undulators is in fact not necessary at this high position. So because uh, I designed them with a broader um, broader yoke, so a slight uh, position error in order of fraction of uh, I don't know um, less than half a millimeter, then that is not a not a problem. So you do not have uh, quadrupole effects from the undulator. So this does, is not necessary. So it's uh, important to determine this, the position of the source against the aperture. So the monochromator is also. So what is important for the monochromator is that um, this is a, a creating monochromator where um, where the the light is uh, hitting. Uh, um, uh, s s scraping, scraping, so like uh, almost parallel to the grating, and then uh, a pair of, uh, of cylindrical lenses is used. So um, it, it is only important that the um, that uh, the light reaches the, the grating. So uh, also the grating is uh, not necessary to be ec um, to extremely precise. It is important that the aperture is determined precisely. Well, my question is, you employ electron delay between the undulators behind light, right? So I suppose we need very accurate information of light wavelength and undulator less distance. That was my question. Ah, okay, the undulator distance. Yeah, so the, um, I, um, I use a glass scale from uh, Heidenheim. Yeah, and uh, I use a very stiff, so this, the, the, this stage is the old one, so for the new experiment I bought a longer one and it is a um, granite stage which is uh, this large and this, so it's very stiff, so and also no, no wobbling of the undulator is allowed and uh, I, there a uh, light scale, a uh, uh, glass scale is attached which measures below one micrometer uh, position accuracy. Oh, thank you very much. More questions? Ah, oh, we go to Giro and then we come forward for the next question. So, uh, thanks Pascal for this nice uh, presentation. Uh, just one uh, question for curiosity. How does your accurate measurement uh, compares with the daily stability of the beam energy at MAMI? Yeah, this is a, a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, okay, I, I was not sure how much time I have. So, um, 
Uh, I have you still have time. time. Okay. So um, this is a different measurement, and this is uh, this I would like to show before. <laughs> so this shows a, a, a complementary measurement before COVID-19, <laughs> and uh, so the um, and here you can see that the beam is quite stable. But for this underlater measurement, uh, we had to switch on the accelerator every day. So that means that uh, you have um, from measurement to measurement. So here you can see the so the, the blue spots here are measurements from MAMI, and you can see in comparison to the last image that um, these these fluctuations are coming. That the, the machine is warming up. So uh, you have, you start at uh, seven, make your first measurement at ten, and the next one at I don't know two o'clock or so, and then uh, the the uh, the machine is still uh, upheating, and this is why uh, I cannot. Um, determine precisely at the moment the difference. So the problem was that we could not have night shifts during COVID-19. Uh, and uh, I am in um, next year, in a, uh, maybe March or April, we will do a calibration measurement for the spectrometer facility. And then, uh, of course, I will uh, also study, study this. Yeah. Very unfortunate. <laughs> OK, and did you have a question at the front here, please? Yeah, so maybe because of the short time, one of the last slides, uh, you just briefly mentioned that uh, the periodicity of this sinusoidal variation, you split your data set into two parts ah, and okay, yes. define uh, this period yeah. uh, for the first part, for the second part, and then find an error. Uh, so do you define this error just based on two numbers or? You no, and the, the total some more data yeah. to get it more precisely. Yeah, it is a systematic study. Okay, so you um, okay okay if you um, so uh, you know uh, bootstrapping. So uh, okay, maybe it's an additional question. <laughs> so okay, uh, of course uh, the, it's not only one one os uh, not uh, the oscillation, but. Um, uh, um, uh, of course, the whole spectrum, also with uh, also the, all the vertical pixels, are included, and uh, then with a, a method called uh, bootstrapping. You, you know what? It, so you you uh, select um, uh, with replacement parts of your data, and determine and you perform a fit. Then uh, select uh, differently, always uh, randomly selecting. And then you get a distribution. This is then uh, not a systematic distribution. This is then a, a statistical distribution. And you get a statistical distribution for the first part and the statistical distribution of the second part. And you get a statistical distribution of, uh, of the whole f fit range and then comparing these uh, three values. Yeah. But it is a systematic study, so you won't see, you cannot see more than, yeah, <laughs> from this. <yeah. clears throat> Thank you. Any more questions? I have one question. Uh, how long does each measurement take? Yeah, good question. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> quite uh, quite long. So it takes about uh, two hours. Here you can uh, you can see it. Uh, so, we, for example, if you start at uh, twelve, it takes almost two two o'clock. So it, they, um, each each uh, each camera picture takes about one second, and uh, at each position, four images are taken, um, and uh, of course you take then 800 positions, and in total then, yeah. So the next time we tr uh, we because the the fitting does not uh, uh, require so many positions, we will reduce the amount of, of positions, but still it will be in the range of hours taking a measurement. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And if there are no further questions, then we will thank Pascal again. And thanks to all the speakers in this session this morning. Thanks to Artem and thanks for Nazanin for these interesting talks. And thanks for the questions that the audience have also been asking. <laughs>